Well, good morning, church. My name is David Kenny, and I'm the pastor here in Walden Community, and we have been in a sermon series about the Holy Spirit for the last couple of weeks, and we only have two more weeks, and then Christmas. I know, I know it'll be Thanksgiving, and then Christmas, but before we know it, it'll be here. And you only have 40 more days until Christmas. You're welcome. So I want to start with a question that you don't need to answer out loud. Uh, typically in church, we sing worship songs, right? And we react and respond differently to the different worship songs. And some of them, we raise our hands. Some of them, we are introspective. We close our eyes. Some of them uh, make us say amen and clap. Maybe also during the service, you might really go deep uh, inward in prayer. And you might even throw a large check into the offering plate and then we all go out to El Bosque to eat lunch. So here's my question. Is that what God wants? Is that what God wants? I mean, from us, I mean, is that it? Is that all? being a Christian is. I mean, let's face it, we, we've lived through, or we're still living through, right? A very volatile year. And uh, you were probably just talking recently to your brother-in-law about the pros and cons of wearing a mask, right? And I would say, were you a Christian in that discussion? Were you a Christian at the post office this month? Were you a Christian at the restaurant this month? Were you a Christian when you voted this year? Or are you only a Christian when you are here in this room? Are you a Christian when you're alone and when nobody's watching? Are you a Christian when you're at the bar? Are you a Christian when you're on your business trips? Or do you leave the Holy Spirit here in this room when you leave? You know, you can't, right? <laughs> you can't. Deuteronomy 3.16 says, He will not leave you or forsake you. And we always think about that passage as a verse that talks about my life. And, and you know, my life gets overwhelming. My life gets out of control. Don't worry because God won't give up on you. And then we think about this passage. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. And as we walk to work, as we head to the bar, as we go to the job site, as we head to the fishing hole, as we go to the poles, as we drive over to my girlfriend's house, he, the Lord, will never leave you. You see, we don't leave God at church, even if we think that we do. We've been saying through this entire series that the Holy Spirit lives in your heart. 1 Corinthians 3, 6 says, Do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? You are the temple. You are the church. You can't leave God in this room. Not if God lives in you. Because how many of us are willing to sing songs in church and raise our hands, we'll have a deep, meaningful prayer, we'll listen to a powerful sermon, and then Monday, we go right back to our normal week. We live like the rest of the world from Monday to Friday. What separates me as a Christian from my coworker? Is my life just as wicked as my neighbors? Do I tell the same jokes? Do I use the same curse words? Do I gossip uh, just the same when we play cards? Do I, do I mutter the same insults under my breath? Well, it's just sin, Pastor David, and we all sin. Yes, that's true, we all sin. But that doesn't make it right. Are we just supposed to justify our sin? Sh shouldn't, shouldn't we worry about sin? Shouldn't we try to be holy? And, and what about sin? I mean, what do you think? We, we, we've said, all, well, all sins are the same in God's eyes. Is that true? Are all sins the same in God's eyes? And if they are, where do you find that in the Bible? Does, does anyone have a verse for that? I mean, there is a verse. It's James 2.10. It says, for whoever keeps the whole law 
but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. James says if you break one law, then that makes you a lawbreaker, right? Of course, all sin is the same. If you break one law, you are guilty, period. All sin condemns us. Another verse, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But at the same time, what it doesn't say is that all sins are the same in God's eyes. It doesn't say that. I mean, all sins make us guilty, absolutely. Well, then all sins are the same. Now, lying and murder are the same. Speeding and adultery are the same. Well, God's a father. Perhaps you're a parent. How is it with your kids? All disobedience uh, to the house rules are wrong, right? Any disobedience to house rules are wrong. If a kid breaks a house rule, they get punished. Even if that punishment is just, you know, a wagging finger and a stern talking to. But some are worse, right? I mean, if my kid gets a D, gets a D on his report card, or comes home drunk from a party, do both of those get the same punishment? Are those two equal in your eyes? Well, then why do we think they're the same in God's eyes? When you punish your kids, aren't there different levels of punishment? God doesn't view speeding and murder the same. God doesn't view lying and adultery the same. The Pharisees made this argument, similar argument to Jesus at the Sermon on the Mount. They said, you know, look, Jesus, we, we don't commit those big sins. We're good people. We don't commit those big sins. We don't murder. And Jesus said, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be liable of judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. Jesus said, no, you don't murder. You don't. But you tell racist jokes. You, you call your fellow man names. You insult. You belittle. You hurt other people with your words. Was Jesus lowering the sin of murder? No. He was raising the sin of insults and slander. The Pharisee said, look, Jesus, we don't commit those big sins. We don't, we don't commit adultery. And Jesus said, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with a lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Jesus said, you keep your marriage bed pure, sure. But instead, you look at dirty magazines. You look at internet porn. You whistle at women when they walk by. You talk lewdly about women with your guy friends. Was Jesus lowering the sin of adultery? No. He was raising the sin of lust. And we've been talking about the Holy Spirit. But I want to divert a little bit away from that, and I want to talk about holiness. Because just like we said last week, your body is a living temple where the Holy Spirit lives. That means your body is an extension of Jesus. When you became a Christian, you are now a part. You are a member of Jesus himself. This is why you can call yourself a Christian, because you are connected to the creator of the universe, because the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. We read last week, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. And I wanted to continue to look at this passage today, perhaps look at it in context, because what it's saying is, you are one in body with God. You are one in body with the Holy Spirit. You are one in body with Jesus Christ. That is why we need the mutual respect of, of each other. In, in this room and with everyone around the world, because we are all a part of the same family of God. We are all a part of the same body. This is why we need mutual respect with our neighbors. This is why we need other uh, uh, respect with people 
who will live in this great state. This is why you are called to be brothers and sisters, even with our enemies, as Jesus teaches, because we are all temples of the Holy Spirit. And listen, I, I'm never going to beg you to become a Christian, okay? I'm never going to plead with you or beg you because it really needs to be the other way around. It's us who is privileged. It's us who is honored. We are the ones who should be begging God for salvation. It's us who should be begging God to be allowed into his good graces. We are a sinner and we are the broken person and we are lying bloodied and bruised in the street. We are the one who reaches out our tired, broken arm and asks for help. We are the one who begs in the street and God extends his invitation to us and we accept that and then we become a part of him. Paul writes to the Corinthian church, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ. See, we are one with the Holy Spirit, one with God. So what? Well, Paul says, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. That word, that word never, that is a very strong expletive in Greek. It's like saying, heck no, kind of. <laughs> Would you force a part of Jesus onto a prostitute. Don't get mad at me. I didn't write this. It's Paul. This is the Bible we're reading. This is the word of God. This is what we do here. And if that verse sounds disgusting, Paul meant it to. He says, Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two become one flesh. Paul says, Why would you sleep with a prostitute? Because the act of sex creates one body. And if you commit adultery, then at the same time, you are forcing Jesus into that same sin. You are forcing Jesus to commit adultery. Do you see how sick that sounds? What, what's Paul's point? Why did he write this passage? Well, when you became baptized and you became a Christian, you became the bride of Christ. You cannot now separate yourself from Jesus. You can't just leave Jesus at church and go off Monday to Saturday and do whatever you want. Paul says, but he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. So the Holy Spirit doesn't just live in you as a separate being. Rather, the Holy Spirit has united with you. Just as you and your spouse are one body, you and the Holy Spirit are one body. So what do I do? What do I do? Paul says, verse 8, flee. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Paul says, what do you do? You run away from it. You run. Are all sins the same? Paul says, no. Paul says, when you sin sexually, you sin against yourself. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. This is our passage from last week. This means as a bride of Christ, when your sin infects your body, when lust comes into your life and sin affects your body, you sin against yourself and the church and the church. Why? Because like the passage says, you are not your own. Your body belongs to Christ. And as such, then all of us, the church, the universal church, right? We are all in this together. I'll give you an example. How many times have you seen a pastor on TV or uh, a Christian on TV in the news? And you thought to yourself, oh my goodness, Oh, no. Who is this crazy person? Right? Please, please, don't, please don't put up on the screen that they're a Christian. They don't represent us. Oh, my goodness, that's not good. Do you want to make your church look bad? Do you want to make your family look bad? We all become ashamed when a public church leader sins. 
when a Christian influencer is caught in sin. It makes a mockery of the church and it hurts all of us. But at the same time, our own lives, we can sin. We can bring shame to ourselves, shame to our families, shame to the church. Your sin does not just affect you. It affects me too. And the same can be said for me. I struggle, right? I struggle just like you. I have to fight the powers of darkness and temptation each and every day, just like you. I don't have it all figured out. I understand it's a fight. It is a daily fight, but we all fight against it. We all fight against it because this is a call for us to be holy. We are called to be holy. The Bible doesn't tell me to be holy in this room. It commands me to be holy every day, 24-7. Leviticus 11 says, For I am the Lord who brought you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. That's quite a challenge. That's quite a call from God himself for you and me to be holy. Peter also wrote this same thing down in his book. He says, since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. Paul writes to the Romans, I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. That's a great verse on holiness. God has called us to a life of holiness. There's, there's no question about that. There's no argument there. What is holiness? Holiness is Christ-likeness. Holy people are in the process, it's a process, Right? Holy people are in the process of becoming more and more like Jesus. We never give up. We never throw in the towel. We are trying every day. It's a, it's a struggle. It's a fight. But we are trying every day. It's a decision that we made to surrender our will to Christ in every moment. That means I decide to turn over complete ownership of my life to him. 1 Corinthians 6.20 ends with, For you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. So when Paul says, you were bought at a price, and he says, you are not your own, that means that mind, those eyes, these hands, they are not yours. So you don't have a right to say what you do with them. You, you don't get a say. Paul says you are, you are taking the eyes of the Holy Spirit and you are taking the thoughts of the Holy Spirit and you are dragging them through the mud. You don't have a right to do that. You are one with God. You gave yourself over to God. You are not your own. Your eyes are God's eyes. You should only look at what God wants you to see. Your hands are God's hands. Your feet are God's. Not just on Sunday. Not just in this room. You and the Holy Spirit are one. This is why the Bible says in Deuteronomy, he will never leave you or forsake you. We might rebel. We might disobey. But God's plan is that he's never going to leave us. His plan is that we are going to grow up in Christ. His plan is we are going to mature. He wants us to be like his son. That's his goal for you and for me. And through his church, through people, through circumstances, through trials, through tribulations, and life itself, he is going to transform you through a process to be more like his son. You don't leave God in this room. And he doesn't leave you. My worry is that some of us have given up. We've tried to be holy. We gave up. And we believe, you know what, it's impossible, so why try? I'm never going to stop sinning, so why bother? Paul answers that question in Romans 6. He says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead 
by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. George Barna is a researcher on Christian trends, and he discovered that there is only a 9% difference between evangelical American Christian culture and that of mainstream American culture, secular world. Only a 9% difference between Christian values and character and conduct and that of non-Christians. Can you believe it? Only 9% difference. Can you believe it? Of course you can, <laughs> right? He also found that you have to have at least a minimum. You have to have at least a minimum of a 30% difference in a subculture, like being a Christian, and the culture, America, a 30% difference is necessary for a subculture to have a changing effect on a culture. You know what that means? It means we're doing a terrible job. There's not enough separation. There's not enough distinctiveness. There's not enough otherness. There's not enough holiness in the church to adequately have an influence on America. We are not different enough. We are not holy enough. If our lives are producing the same stuff as the rest of the world, why should the world sit up and listen to our message? Don't be disillusioned. Don't be surprised when the world doesn't vote for Christian values. Because the rest of the year, we don't model them. Sadly, Christians are all too often defined by what we're against and what we don't do. But holiness is not an absence of action. Holiness is not a negative. Holiness is a positive because the world will notice what you do so much more than it will ever take notice of what you don't do. Paul and Silas stayed at a friend's house, Jason's house. When they went to Thessalonica, Paul and Silas stayed at their friend Jason's house. And when the people of that town heard that Paul and Silas were in town, they rushed Jason's house. They stormed his house and drug him out into the street. The Bible says they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. Do you understand? First century Christians with no cell phones, no internet, no social media, no technology, they had a reputation, they had an influence so large, so wide, that they had turned the world upside down because they loved, sacrificed, and lived lives that were so radically different from everybody else. Not 9% different, and I would argue probably a lot more than 30% different. They were not self-centered like their neighbors. The world teaches us to be self-centered, to put myself first, my family first. They were cross-centered. They were Jesus-centered. They lived holy, otherly, set-apart lives. And the world took notice. In fact, first-century Christians were even willing to die for Jesus. They were even willing to die for one another. And we find it difficult to get out of bed on Sunday morning to go to church. We find it difficult to even come to an evening Bible study. We find it even difficult to raise our hands and say, no, I'll teach Sunday school. I'll make sure the gospel gets passed on to this next generation. We say, nah, I, you know what? I just don't have time. I don't have time. You know how many volunteers Pastor Kevin has to teach the youth group? One. You know how many volunteers we have to teach Sunday school to our little children? One. Romans 12 says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Paul says, after you become a Christian, true and proper worship 
is not the songs you sing. And it's not the fact that you raise your hands or not the fact that you close your eyes. He says, that's not what God cares about. No, what God cares about is that you have separated yourself to the Lord. This is a commitment. It's a clear decision to put your faith in Christ forward and it's moving you towards holiness. This request, when he says offer your bodies, it's not a command. It's an invitation. Paul says, I urge you right? He says, I urge you to take action. Paul is pleading with his readers by trying to touch them on an an emotional level. And he tells them how they can start. Right in the very next verse, in verse 2, he says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The change in your behavior, this is where it starts. It starts up here. It starts in your brain. If you're going to step away from trying to be like everybody else in America, you're going to try to step aside and be different from everybody else in the world, the change starts up here. And then he gives you some incentive in the next verse. He says, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is like, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Oswald Chambers, who wrote the devotional, My Utmost for His Highest, He says, discipleship and salvation are two different things. A disciple is one who, realizing the meaning of the atonement, deliberately gives himself to Jesus Christ in unspeakable gratitude. Jesus invites us to take up our cross and follow him daily. We are at perfect liberty to toss up our spiritual heads and say, no, thank you, that's a bit too stern for me. And the Lord will never say a word. We can do exactly what we like. He will never plead, but the opportunity is there to live a life that God rewards. Look at one more thing. When Paul says, therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Paul says, why? Why should you live a holy life? He says, in view of God's mercy. Paul knows that he can't convince you to change. Nothing he says is going to convince you to live a different life. So rather, he says, don't do it for me. Don't do it because I ask. Do it for God. Do it because of all the things that God has done for you. In other words, don't live a holy life because it's your duty. Do it out of love. Do it out of appreciation for what God has done for you. When you read the Bible, you'll notice there's a lot of things in the Bible that are holy. There's a holy temple, there's a holy Sabbath, there's a holy altar. Even the ground where Moses stood was holy ground, right? Holy things are separated from common things. That's all. Common things belong to the world. Holy things belong to God. When God's milk is in the refrigerator and God's cookies are in the cupboard and he wants everyone to know that they belong to him, he writes his word, holy, across them. It's his way of saying, this is mine. This is not the world's. Isaiah 6 says, And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Revelation says, Four living creatures, each of them six wings, are full of eyes all around and within, and day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. If it belongs to God, it's holy, because he is holy. End of story. If it belongs to God, then it's holy because he is holy. What's holy in your life? What's holy in your home? What kind of things do you allow in your home? Are they holy things? What kind of things do you allow in your mind? Are they holy? What shows do you watch? 
Would you watch them with Jesus sitting right next to you? When your family goes home this afternoon, take some time and walk around and look. Walk your property. Pray. Pray with your family. Dedicate your home to the Lord. In Christian circles, we would say that's an ordination. Ordain your house for God. Ordain your family for God. Not only can you dedicate those things to God and allow them to become holy for their, for their use, but you can also dedicate your heart. Dedicate your heart and your soul and your mind to God as well. You have the opportunity to make a decision today about your holiness. Don't think about it as a life of no's and about what you're going to give up, but rather about entering into a world of God's blessing and his favor and his love. You know, I think we, we end some sermons with an altar call and we ask new believers to become a Christian and to dedicate their lives for the very first time. But what about the rest of us who have already made a decision a, a while back or perhaps along the way, uh, we just got sidetracked and we slipped or fell. Maybe you're struggling with personal holiness. Maybe you're struggling with giving God your whole life, surrendering control, right? Surrendering, surrendering control of your whole life. And you feel like, maybe I'm holding back. And you, you've, you've tried over and over again to surrender, and you keep finding yourself back in the driver's seat, and God is somewhere. Maybe he's in the trunk. You always hold the remote. You're always out in front leading. I want you to sit right where you are. And I want you to just close your eyes. And I want you to list, think about, all the blessings you have from God. All the mercies Paul like, talks about. All the, all the mercies that you have experienced. You think about the blood of Christ that was shed for you. The love that he gives you, the new life that you live, the forgiveness that you have experienced, the forever friendship of your Savior, of having a hearing God who listens and answers to your prayers, a God who meets your needs, a God who cares for you, a God who promises to Never leave you or forsake you. Reflect for a moment if you need to. Hasn't God blessed you? Hasn't he been good to you? Could you then make a decision today that you're going to reapply yourself? You're going to live more for him, live better for him. And you're going to do better than 9%. You're going to be holy because God is holy. And you are not your own. You are bought with a price. Father, in the name of Jesus, your word says, if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I confess my sins. And I thank you for your forgiveness and your cleansing. Father, I desire a closer walk with you. Your word says if I draw closer to the Spirit, he will draw closer to me. Father, I rededicate my spirit, I rededicate my mind, I rededicate my soul, and I rededicate my body back to you. And I ask you for a fresh anointing on my whole life. A hundred percent. I thank you for the blood of Jesus, which continually cleanses me from all unrighteousness. Thank you, Lord God, for allowing me to rededicate my life back to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for watching uh, this morning. Thanks for hanging out with us. If uh, this is your first time watching, uh, we broadcast every Sunday here on YouTube. Uh, if you're familiar with our uh, sermons or our church, please clip and copy the link 
the YouTube link above there. Of course, like and subscribe to this channel. Uh, post this to your own Facebook wall or your own social media wall, or perhaps maybe post it to a friend's wall or a family member's wall who you think might benefit from hearing this sermon today. I love you guys. I'll see you next time. Bye.